So today we're going to be talking about some best practices for network design and deployment. So the objectives of this session are to understand the importance of the industrial network infrastructure, um, understand the life cycle, including the assessment, design, and deployment, um, best practices for deploying these networks. Um, we will also be talking about um, our partner ecosystem. So when I'm presenting the solution, um, this is really best practices um, garnered from my experience and work here at Panduit. And we uh, hope that uh, you'll find this to be very educational. Um, we'll provide you some resources so that you can uh, emulate the, uh, the characteristics of this the solution set as you need to. And um, uh, hopefully we uh, help kind of change the, uh, the tenor and nature of uh, this business and move uh, uh, the infrastructure uh, design and deployment to kind of a new level. So the first thing is to understand you know, the importance of the, uh, the physical uh, infrastructure and network deployment. And to do this, I really look at the growth of IoT. Um, we can see that uh, there are a lot more things being connected to the networks. There's a lot more information um, that is being connected through the IoT. In the consumer world, there's lots of devices like the home security thermostats, health monitoring, even garage door openers, coffee makers, etc. cetera. Um, in the industrial world, we're seeing a similar explosion. And this is related to some of the wireless sensing devices. Um, the industrial automation control systems are now leveraging some of these wireless devices. We've got uh, um, many different types of sensors that are now providing real-time information to uh, dashboards and to, uh, to people in manufacturing on their smartphones. So right now, um, we're expecting that we're, uh, there'll be 50 billion, that's a billion with a B, smart objects that are going to be out um, in the, uh, the industry by, uh, by 2020. And that's uh, about six times greater than the world's population. So this is becoming a, a real big trend in industrial networks, and there's some other trends that are taking place too um, to support this. So one of those is the migration from a switch-centric topology. Um, so we're migrating to this uh, switch center topology instead of having a controller or, or a PLC type central topology. We have a lot more data that is being put onto these networks and it's starting to stretch the limitations of the legacy, legacy networks that are out there. Um, we're moving to more of a standard uh, base. The industrial ethernet is really enabling some of the IT solutions to now be used on the plant floor. And of course, all of this is now providing some real-time analytics. Now, this is also providing us a challenge too, um, because we now need to be able to connect um, to the factory floor and boost our productivity um, throughout the whole enterprise. We've got uh, two important statistics here um, related to IoT, and so 95% of uh, C-suite executives expect that they're going to be using IoT in the next three years' time, and 63% of them believe that those companies that are slow to integrate uh, IoT are going to fall behind the competition. So we'll come to a, a, an, our interactive session here, and we will go to the, uh, the first poll question. All right, Jim, I went ahead and launched the poll questions. We'll give you just a couple minutes here to go ahead and answer the question. Okay, Jim, it looks like we are completed here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close out the poll. Thank you.
So one of the first questions we want to, to ask everybody, um, you know, when they're talking about using networks and manufacturing is how dependent is your manufacturing on the network? Um, so we have a number of uh, questions here and basically if you answer no to any of these questions then you are um, your manufacturing there is very dependent on the network so um, you know it's very important you know to understand that in for manufacturing you can't ship product a lot of times if you don't have the regulatory information um, you know on the product that's being um, shipped so the network is very very dependent um, or the the manufacturing is very dependent on the network being um, live and functioning so one of the things we see is a, a lot of very poor infrastructures and these are some um, you know examples of uh, the network so that we see out on the manufacturing floor and a lot of these things are uh, just caused because of uh, Oh, poor housekeeping, um, expansion of networks without a real good plan, um, and what ends up happening is you have poor cable management, you uh, have identification that's missing on the, the cabling itself, uh, there's grounding and bonding issues, and uh, many issues where the network is not really up to the standards. It's very important that we understand that the infrastructure that we're putting in is going to have to outlast a lot of the other manufacturing um, aspects. So the hardware that we deploy, the network switches, controllers, devices, um, typically we will have to use the same infrastructure um, and replace that hardware two times. And the software that's used on the network such as you know the uh, uh, data historians, OEE, uh, and, and other types of HMI software, etc. All that's going to be replaced three times over the course of the network. So the network we're putting in right now is very important, and we need to make sure we have the proper planning. We do future proofing, make sure we do uh, capacity balancing and things like that um, when we're putting in the network. And the last uh, statistic here that I like to point out is that 70% of the network failures are attributed to the physical infrastructure. So again, highlighting the importance of taking some care when we put in the infrastructure because it's going to have to last us for the next 25 years. With that said, we also want to, you know, discuss with our uh, clients and customers and also take a look at our own uh, you know manufacturing capabilities and determine where we are kind of in this continuum um, we call this the network fabric maturity model and it goes from being uh, very restrictive um, where you've got many OT many operational technology networks and very little convergence you've got sprawl over the networks you've got islands of automation there's no real strategy and there's really no security that's provided in that uh, scenario. And then we move into more of the functional um, area where we have OT, physical convergence, and this is where we're going to be using uh, you know, the uh, uh, common network throughout the OT um, area. We're going to use some standards. Um, we're going to make sure that uh, we're using similar technologies throughout and this is going to you know help us with the security it's going to help us provide visibility it's going to help us um, provide information throughout the OT area then we move into area three which is where we're going to converge the OT the operational um, area and the IT um, networks and so this is a uh, something called CPWE oftentimes uh, and so this means that we're going to be using similar technologies throughout our entire enterprise. And so this is going to allow us to virtualize some plant applications. It's going to allow us to leverage a lot of good IT standards. Um, and it's also going to help us be able to uh, 
um, propagate the data throughout our network, turning the data into actionable information, and also is going to start providing us with a, a much tighter security throughout the network. Our vision is to move into this network fabric um, emergence. Um, this is the innovative phase, and this is where we're going to be using a, a fabric approach for both the wired and wireless infrastructure. Um, we're going to be, you know, moving the IoT um, and combining that with our typical OT and IT. Um, so this way we have a scalable technology. We're going to be able to deliver um, on the uh, edge computing, video, cloud service, etc. throughout. Um, and we're actually going to be able to start um, using our network as a way to actually drive some business value that we never were able to before. Um, we're going to be able to do some predictive and uh, um, hyper awareness of the network health and we're going to be able to uh, be able to plug all those security holes as well. So that's uh, the, the network maturity model and most customers find themselves, oh, you know, somewhere between one and two. Some of the more progressive um, manufacturing plants are, have taken advantage of the CPWE and are over in level three. Um, and uh, some are now pushing that envelope and moving into the network fabric emergence stage. So this now teases up for our um, the second of the three questions. Okay, Jim, I'll go ahead and launch the question. Give a couple moments to uh, answer the question. Okay, Jim, I'm going to go ahead and close the question. Oh, thank you. So now let's move into um, the some of the best practices we have um, for our networks, and I break those down into three different areas. Um, one of them is doing assessment, um, design, and then deployment. Um, the assessment area is being able to take a, a good audit of what you have, um, how your networks have been deployed. Um, you know, looking at some things such as uh, um, your capabilities for th to withstand thermals, um, looking at uh, maybe grounding and bonding, and, and being able to basically map your entire network and understand the devices and capabilities that you have on your network. So that's all under the assess um, pillar. The design is really doing that physical infrastructure design, and we'll show you uh, some of the best practices for that design. And then deploy is then um, being able to ensure that the things were designed are actually deployed, um, that the design intent has actually been put out in the field, making sure that uh, you've got uh, good documentation, traceability, um, and supporting you know, uh, management of the network in the future. So that all falls under that deploy um, pillar. So let's talk a little bit about some ways to do the network assessment. Um, so when we do the network assessment, one of the things we'll do is we'll do an industrial network mapping and evaluation. So that means uh, collecting uh, an, a list of all the devices that are connected to your network, and we use a tool to go out there and uh, do that discovery, do that mapping automatically. And so that'll show us the, how the network is physically connected together. Um, you know, it also will show exactly which port is connected to which device and will give us a list of all the devices that are on our network. Um, we'll have the, the network field names and then also with that discovery we can look at the uh, uh, bandwidth utilization throughout the network. So we can look at the overall uh, capacity and capabilities of our network we can see if there's some uh, devices on there that are hogging a lot of uh, bandwidth. Um, we can see if we've uh, um, maybe got excessive uh, traffic um, 
due to um, you know propagation of unmanaged switches and things like that. And so um, you know being able to to have a tool like this really aids us um, to identify what we've got deployed out on our network, and then we can use that information to then evaluate um, against some different areas. And in this case here, what we've done is we're showing the, uh, the seven different areas, functional areas, um, that we evaluate the system, you know, looking at the racks and cabinets, cabling, label administration, pathways, the uh, power to all the, the racks and devices, the grounding, as well as uh, thermal performance and airflow. So um, we'll go on and do that audit. Now, when we're doing this type of uh, evaluation, um, we're not using our opinion, but we're actually evaluating this against the applicable industry standards. And so on this slide here, we've uh, shown some of the different standards that are being used. Um, there are some common standards, um, which are provided to us by, um, by ANSI and TIA. And then for the OT side of things, there are some um, uh, standards, the uh, 1005, which are industrial standards um, that we utilize. And then there also are some component standards that we need to follow. And that'll tell us about you know, um, the performance uh, capabilities, um, architectures, the methods for termination um, of our copper and fiber network and how to uh, you know, address each of those um, elements as far as deployment um, and the types of testing that is required here to meet the, uh, the telecommunication standards. So one of the best practices I'd like to highlight is the fact is the utilization of the TIA um, standards. If um, you haven't uh, had a chance to explore some of those, um, you can, you know, this is a good opportunity to, to, you know, look at the standards and then look to see how you can leverage these standards um, in both your assessments as well as moving forward into your design activities. One of the other important things to look at is um, how the networks are segregated. And we like to utilize um, a system called uh, CPWE. Uh, this was something developed by Rockwell Automation and Cisco. Um, and Panduit has uh, now in, been included in the latest revision of this um, as part of the, uh, the physical infrastructure um, portion. Uh, the basic framework is from uh, the Purdue model for a control hierarchy. Um, and we have some different levels here going from the enterprise, um, then going to the industrial demilitarized zone and to the industrial zone and then to the different levels at the plant. Um, one of the things is to, uh, uh, you know, utilize a best practice. Um, you know, if you've got a network of um, significant size, um, putting in an industrial DMZ to segregate the traffic between the enterprise and the industrial side is, uh, is recommended. Um, if you've got a very small deployment, um, maybe using VLANs will be, uh, is, is acceptable as well. But if you've got a medium to large size deployment, we really um, recommend you know, utilizing a DMZ type approach to make sure that you're segregating the traffic um, from your enterprise and not having that affect your controls operation. Um, at the level four and five, down at the bottom, we depict a couple of different architectures. We have a redundant star, um, we have a ring, and then we have a, a bus type methodology. So these are the, the three different types of, uh, of network topologies that we'll, we'll be utilizing. So going into a little bit more detail on the CPWE, um, we've kind of broken down some of the, you know, different areas um, for our solutions. Uh, you know, a lot of times we'll be doing a plant-wide enterprise type of uh, configuration. Um, so we'll be using uh, pre-configured integrated solutions there at the, uh, the enterprise level and then moving into the uh, 
um, micro data center, industrial data frame for the communications between the enterprise and the plant floor. And then for the in uh, industrial distribution, um, where we have a real high density of devices, um, you know, we show using a distributed type uh, solution with the network zone enclosures and oftentimes going into the, uh, the control panels themselves. So as we walk through there, we'll have the enterprise cabinets at the enterprise level. And then we'll use the micro data center and the industrial data frame um, here at the mid level. And then using the network zone enclosures or the control panels at the lower level. So we now have these building blocks that we'll be utilizing and using these building blocks allows us to um, deploy things very quickly. It helps us um, provide um, rapid designs and these are proven architectures um, that we can move forward so we know um, that uh, we've got a robust solution uh, that we're designing around. So what we really talked about here is the physical. Um, to really do a network design, the best approach is there is a logical component as well. So um, we always have you know, the logical piece and the physical piece. And the logical piece, this is where we really turn to the CSIA partners. Um, and they're the people who can help create that uh, logical architecture. And then uh, we'll you know, using this uh, the Panduit One type solution, um, either through Panduit or some of our um, Panduit One partners um, who've been trained on the you know, physical design and physical deployment. Uh, they can then take that logical um, design and translate that into an executable, buildable design using some of these uh, the building blocks that we just discussed on the previous slide. So going into the logical design itself, um, there's a number of elements in the logical design. Um, and these are things that the CSIA um, has some good practices. And uh, I know you guys are, are pretty familiar with being able to you know, develop the block topology, the switch topology, selecting the different types of uh, uh, network devices, um, and then also providing the overall network schemas the VLANs, the uh, names, functions, the IP address, and then coming up with the switch configurations, uh, those command line instructions to help deploy the network. So those are all the elements of the logical design. And then we'll take those building blocks that we showed, um, you know, through the CPWE model, and then we will, you know, create the, uh, the physical design. Now, we'll have to consider some things such as, uh, you know, the distances involved there um, that will, um, you know, dictate the types of media that we'll utilize, the environmental conditions, um, something called MICE, which is an acronym for uh, mechanical, um, I is for ingress, C is for chemical climactic, and E is for uh, EMF. And so we'll look at the, the levels uh, of those environmentals for the MICE to help us determine the proper product selection as well as the, uh, the way that we'll actually do the uh, design implementation. Um, of course, we'll be using a structured cabling approach um, using switch convergence uh, to help us uh, deploy. So let's now look into the constructible methodology that we use and so one of the, uh, the other best practices um, that I'd like to identify is utilizing the CSI um, type methodology. CSI stands for the Construction Standards Institute. So combining the CSI uh, Construction Standards Institute along with TIA is really uh, the, the cornerstones of, um, of our, the solution we're showing here. And we think that this is really a best practice. Um, the CSI standard is really an architectural standard. So when you design your telecommunication elements, um, everything will fit into that standard architectural package. So we uh, will do this in three phases. The first phase is uh, 
um, just the planning, it's identifying the requirements, uh, setting up the different functional areas, do the high-level space planning um, and connectivity. And then the second phase is getting into the details, um, looking at the individual racks, um, and the cabinets, uh, going down into the ports, um, going into the details um, that are needed to you know, specify all the, uh, the cabling that's going to be run. Um, and then we hit the phase three, um, where we provide a cable schedule, the bill of material, and then a uh, specification package um, that then explains exactly um, how this network is going to be implemented. And so the, the specifications are done on a project basis. They are um, not generic. Um, they actually, you know, address the, the key elements that will be coming up through the design. So a lot of words there. Let me show you some pictures. And I think this will help, uh, you know, explain the methodology a little bit better. So our, you know, our phase zero um, is really defining the what we're going to be doing, you know, by a statement of work. Um, and then once we start the project, we'll move into the how, and that's uh, what we call a program report. And so the program report is going to be the technical performance expectations and functional requirements. Um, and all this will be done by meeting with the owner to determine the requirements, um, you know, walking their facility, looking for, you know, um, any requirements, and then identifying uh, so the, the type of solutions can be needed. So it'll go down to the level of showing the cable media selection, the topologies, redundancy requirements, um, looking for available pathways, um, looking for the locations that we're going to be putting all the components. And so all of um, that gets described in words in the program report. Then we take that program report, and uh, I'm going to kind of walk through the different elements here of phase one, starting in the upper right. And so we start with a one-line diagram. And so the one-line diagram um, shows how the different devices are going to be physically connected. So it's going to show um, also the media that's going to be used to connect the different devices, all at a high level, so that we have a, a nice organizational flow. Um, and we'll be identifying, you know, the, uh, the enclosures, uh, the, the cabinets, et cetera, on this one-line diagram. And uh, then we'll be going into the details of where those devices are going to be located. By moving to the left, um, we're showing in the room where we're actually physically mounting the racks and cabinets. And then moving farther to the left, we're then going to show where those locations are going to be within the plant floor. And then we'll also show the proposed routings um, of how we're going to connect all those devices together. So basically taking the one line diagram and now putting it onto the plant floor. Um, and just two different examples of that um, here. So after we've now identified all the devices, all the locations, um, and basically how we're going to wire them up at a high level. We're now ready to move into the more details. So the, the details are now going into the switch elevation views. And uh, we'll be showing all the, the devices and you know where they're going to be located in the rack. Or if it's in a, an enclosure, we'll show uh, you know the patch panels and the switch locations, and then get down to the port level. So each port will then, uh, you know, have have a certain uh, uh, label associated with it, and then we'll be referencing that uh, port position um, with our cable schedule. So we'll come up with a a, um, a way of identifying every single wire that's going to be placed. Um, so this way, you understand when you grab a wire out in the field it'll have the from and to um, on the wire itself so you know exactly where and which port uh, this, uh, the wire is going into. Um, we also show some typical details of how everything gets mounted. 
um, and as well as the how the grounding and bonding uh, needs to be uh, um, deployed. All that goes together um, along with a cable schedule. And so the cable schedule shows you every cable that needs to be run. It's going to identify the pathway that's going to be running in. It's going to identify the label. It goes on the from and the to, the uh, number of strands, the type of media, um, et cetera, as well as the part number of the cable. So this becomes a nice checklist um, for going ahead and you know developing um, a bill of material and also is very useful out in the field becomes your checklist to make sure that everything's installed as designed. So all this now gets combined together into what we call a final documentation package. Um, so this is a construction package. Um, it's going to consist of all the elements we just talked about as well as the uh, specification. And so uh, the specification is a three-part specification. The first part is the general. Um, it talks about the requirements, uh, the type of documentation that's going to be needed, um, the, the uh, capabilities and uh, uh, background of the installer, the minimum requirements that they need to be able to meet. Uh, the second chapter then is uh, how you handle the materials, how you're going to receive the materials, what you're going to do um, when you're putting up the materials. Um, it'll go down to the detail of saying, you know, this is the the spacing that we need to uh, achieve to support um, the cable between the MDC and the IDF, um, identifying that we'll be using, for example, uh, non-continuous cable supports like J-hooks, things like that, um, and the, the spacing requirements for all of those, as well as methods for maintaining the bend radius, um, how you're going to handle the fiber, and things like that. So all that's in the middle chapter. And then the final chapter is then the testing requirements um, and the documentation requirements so that, you know, you uh, it'll specify the type of test that is needed as well as um, the information that needs to be collected um, so that you get the, uh, the warranty um, as specified by the cabling manufacturer. Now, this now is, you know, the final design, so this can now go out to bid, um, and then once it's been bid, you know, we get into the installation phase. And so one of the best practices that we've uh, um, come across is, uh, is ensuring that the deployment is overseed by a, um, an RCDD, okay? And so that, um, you know, as a, a BICSI uh, certified RCDD, will be there and he'll making sure that everything is installed with the design specifications. What we will typically do is uh, you know, have that uh, designer of the system uh, be there at the kickoff meeting and so he'll walk through the uh, solution with the designers or the, the installers rather and then we'll come back uh, about the 50 percent completion stage to make sure that everything is uh, going according to plan. Um, we'll develop a punch list and remediation steps that need to be achieved um, at that 50% level. And then we'll come back again at that 90% level to make sure that everything has been installed, um, you know, per the specifications, um, making sure, you know, acting as an owner's rep uh, to make sure that uh, you know, all the standards have been uh, been achieved. And then also making sure that all the as-built documentation, et cetera, is, uh, is been provided. So with that said, I think we're now on to our third poll question of the, of the three. Okay, Jim, I went ahead and launched that. We'll give a minute or two to answer the question. Jim, it does look like the majority has voted, so I'll go ahead and hand it back to you. Oh, thank you. Um, I'd like to now go into uh, some case studies, or at least a case study um, that we've put together. And so the, the case study really is showing how um, uh, 
the system integrator community um, as well as the installers and uh, also our you know distribution partners have all come together um, in what we call the Panduit ecosystem um, to deliver value um, to the end user and by you know aligning these three elements um, you know and using the uh, the Panduit one partner program um, we use this to deliver value um, and you know to actually uh, design and install the uh, complete solution so um, oftentimes you know we'll be notified about an opportunity a new project through our distribution partner and it's very important you know that uh, uh, we utilize them to uh, throughout the whole project and this is a, a project I like to talk about is one called Nusa Yogurt um, Nusa Yogurt uh, if you haven't tried their product it's a, a delicious yogurt um, it's from an Australian company who decided to put a green field in uh, the Colorado area. And just to, to call out the, uh, you know, some of the challenges, uh, this was a, a green field expansion project they were working on, um, and they needed to, to have a hardened network, um, something that was going to be well documented, secure. Um, you know, this does deal with food products and so they do have regula regulatory issues they need to be able to comply with um, they also were going through a great deal of expansion and knew that they had to be able to uh, address future capability and so bringing together this ecosystem we were able to uh, deliver a solution to, uh, to Nusa Yogurt uh, it was a combination of you know the controls were with Rockwell Automation and the network was with Cisco um, uh, Panduit did do the uh, the initial physical design, um, working with uh, Rexel, and all of this was orchestrated by Melisco Engineering. So Melisco Engineering really was the uh, you know the lead um, on this, and they were also doing the controls activity as well. Um, so they had a you know a great understanding of the requirements and needs um, and you know working with the ecosystem and then bringing in Piper uh, electrical uh, to do the final installation it was a very successful project and um, so this is a, a good illustration of that ecosystem um, working together the way it should and you know I just can't say enough about the CSIA um, you know certification and the the types of um, SIs that are part of CSIA. So um, that kind of brings us to the end of our presentation. I wanted to bring up just a quick slide here of mentioning that we do have a number of resources to help you with these best practices. Um, and I've included some links here. The, the CPWE um, you know, is available at the, the Rockwell site. Um, and we also have some e-learning that's available um, through ipadvantage.org. And then at Panduit, we have some of these reference architectures depicted in what we call uh, popular configuration drawings. And so this will you know, help show you some uh, proven architectures um, and the building block approach that we talked about. So with that said, I'd like to... Uh, now uh, open this up for some questions. Thanks, Jim. Um, we will use this time to answer questions. Uh, please feel free to submit your questions utilizing the chat box on the GoToWebinar app. We will answer as many questions as we have um, time allowed. All right, Jim, it looks like I have uh, my first question here. As part of the industrial networking trends, you mentioned that the migration from a switch-centric topology, what benefits do you see arising from this trend? Well, um, yeah, so we're moving more to a switch-centric topology. Um, one of the big benefits is that the, uh, the PLC um, used to act as a, um, a firewall, uh, preventing you know, information uh, flow restricting the information flow 
And this was needed because uh, a lot of the uh, PLC networks were proprietary and had limited capability um, at the you know the time. Now that we're moving to Ethernet IP, we have a great deal of bandwidth uh, capabilities, um, and so we no longer need to have the PLC as the center of the universe, but we can now move the uh, industrial switch in there, and so. One of the big advantages is if you needed to have information sent from a limit switch or device um, up to the uh, the information system to the MES level or um, you know SCADA system, um, you had to programmatically allow the pass of the data through the PLC. Um, now with uh, the switch now connecting directly to the device and then the PLC coming off of the device and then also the MES um, information uh, being transmitted right through the switch. This does no longer is required, so we can now have direct information, um, and the information can be shared uh, with any device within the facility that needs it. So you may have uh, multiple devices who would need the, uh, um, the data from a, a, a device on the plant floor, and now they can share that seamlessly and you don't have to do it programmatically. So this really allows us to expand much faster. Um, it enhances the scalability. Um, and, you know, it is uh, uh, allowing us to, uh, to deliver the IoT um, type fabric approach that we discussed as well. Okay. I do have another question. It's actually a couple questions here. Um, do you see any risks of merging the business, operational, and security networks together? Could these type of networks coexist on the same switch or leveraging common media? Okay. So this is um, a, a, a trend that we're seeing actually uh, going the other direction. Um, we're finding that, uh, well, initially people said, let's uh, do convergence and let's put everything all on the same network and we can combine it all together. What they've uh, now discovered kind of as a best practice is really we should segregate those networks. Um, and to think about this, you know, we've got operations uh, taking place on the plant floor. Um, we've got uh, safety issues taking place there and data. Uh, last thing we want to do is on the same wire and same network um, be putting an operator who's uh, searching the uh, the internet. Um, we want to really segregate and get that uh, office traffic um, off of our OT network. So we're really seeing um, where the segregation is being utilized more and more. Um, and there are you know, there is a cost and benefit that has to be weighed here. Um, as you move in kind of the medium to large size plant, we really recommend that not only do you not have uh, the same devices connected to the enterprise um, on the same wire, but we actually suggest you, you move it to where you put it in a different switch or a lot of times in a separate cabinet. Um, so we'll be moving, um, you know, actually segregating the business, the security, um, the um, operational technology, the OT networks, um, you know, onto their own uh, network switches in a lot of case. And that makes sense, too, because we're going to have different people maintaining those. Um, you know, we'll have the OT uh, uh, maintenance people maintaining the um, OT side and the IT will be supporting the voice over IP um, and the voice over IP paging systems and camera systems and things like that. Um, so we'll have different people who need to get access to these different uh, uh, different areas. So I think um, as we you know progress, we're going to see more and more uh, divergence of having the OT and uh, IT networks coexisting and more and more segregation of these. Okay. It uh, looks like I have uh, one more question. 
It says, typically our physical design would consist only of identifying switch locations, MDZ, and ZE on site drawings. In your opinion, is this sufficient? Is the cost justified to generate all these additional drawings and specifications? Great question. And so, um, you know, I, again, I'm showing a, a best practice, and this is a, a very complete solution. And certainly it is something that would, you know, make the maintenance um, in the future much easier. Um, it really depends on uh, uh, the, the skill level uh, of the SI and the installer and the, the end user with this type of uh, approach. Um, what we find is that uh, you know, if you do multiple sites and as a customer learns more and more, um, you know, these designs come together very, very quickly. And so I would say that um, you know going down this venture may be a little bit more costly on the first go round, but as they start adopting the standards and the methodology, I think that actually um, you get a lot more benefit, and these uh, solutions go together very quickly. Now you mentioned about just having a a, a core level, um, and so if you go back to you know the slides I showed, we had a three-phased approach. Essentially, what you were suggesting was that we only do phase one, um, and we don't uh, do the design for phase two. Um, what I guess I would say is um, certainly that could be done, but my recommendation is that somebody still needs to do a complete cable schedule. Somebody still needs to identify all the ports and locations and come up with the, the overall identification scheme. So um, certainly uh, there are a number of PCIs who have RCDDs on staff, and so that could be done as part of the installation. So my recommendation would be, no, don't cut corners. You need to have all the elements. Um, however, it may make more sense to, uh, to maybe you know, uh, divide and conquer and move the responsibilities to the different parties um, to make sure that you still have that documentation. Remember, you're going to have this network around for 25 years, so you want to make sure you do a real good job of the installation and documentation. We all know that networks are never static, right? Um, there's always going to be changes, um, moves, ads, etc., on the network. And so starting off with some real good documentation um, will prevent some of the, uh, oh, the network sprawl that we see and the lack of housekeeping and uh, things like that. So I really recommend that you start from the get-go with a real tight package, make sure that all the standards are met um, so that you can maintain that network for the next 25 years. Okay, Jim, thanks. It looks like we have time for one more question here. Um, past enterprise um, physical design topologies were very simple home runs back to an IDF or data center, is this hierarchy approach adding extra complication? So I believe the, um, the question here is really looking at the, the overall value of having a distributed um, network solution. And I, I would say uh, let's go back to uh, the early days of controls um, where you know, before we had remote I.O. and things like that, we did exactly that. We ran home runs back to the, the PLC. And we had mezzanines that were full of control panels, all lined up one after another. Um, as in the control industry, we discovered that um, by putting the I.O. closer to the machine elements, distributing that I.O., um, that shortened the amount of cabling that we needed to do, use to the, uh, you know, um, to get to the PLC. So we just have a short run going from the device to a cabinet remote with the uh, remote I.O. And then we'd have one cable that connects the remote I.O. back to the PLC. 
and that saved us a lot of costs. It saved us a lot of real estate, and actually allowed us to uh, to scale and deploy much easier. So um, the question you mentioned there sounds very analogous to me, to uh, you know enterprise um, areas where that are used to running home runs, you know directly to the uh, RJ45 port in your cube, um, and then you know, we're proposing they move to a distributed type solution. Um, certainly at the, the low end, if you've only got a handful of drops, it's very, very simple. Yes, home runs are fine. As soon as you move into a, uh, you know, a larger installation, I think you'll find the benefits of a distributed architecture will outweigh the costs. And then also it gives you so much more flexibility. Um, so, I would really only ever recommend that you do the home run methodology if you've got guarantees that you're really not going to be doing any expansion um, because you know having distributed architecture whether it's in the enterprise or whether it's like the CPWE um, depiction we have there for the plant floor really makes a lot more sense especially if you're going to have to you know add functionality and capability in the future and the way things are growing, we know that additional capability is most likely going to be needed. Okay, it looks like we are out of questions and out of time. <laughs>